Hello, and welcome to our video fireside chat. My name is Daniel Newman, and I'm the founding partner and chief analyst at Futurum Research and the CEO of the Futurum Group. I've been following AI and digital transformation topics for years, and I'm always looking at how the biggest challenges are being tackled by businesses using technology. Generative AI is the hottest topic in tech right now, and this for good reason. We saw ChatGPT reach 100 million users in just two months after its launch. This makes it the fastest growing consumer internet app ever. And of course, there's a lot of interesting work going on in this space. We're seeing Intel and Hugging Face, who I'll be talking to today. They're focusing on leading everything from the open source library for machine learning at Hugging Face, and of course, the compute and the technology behind that at Intel. Today, we'll be discussing generative AI, its impact on the world's compute needs, and why an open ecosystem matters, and how we should be thinking about the role of ethics in the latest wave of AI developments. Kavitha, I'm gonna ask you the first question. We're hearing so much about ChatGPT, including what this technology is capable of and how it's being built. Of course, this brings questions to its broader societal implications and what the impact means in our lives. I'd love to get your perspective on how ChatGPT has gotten all this attention, but why? People are so excited about it. And of course, how is this going to impact the demand for compute? Thanks, Daniel, for the question. We have been seeing in the industry the move from predictive AI to generative AI for quite some time now. So we always had DALI, we had uh, GPT 3.5. What ChatGPT Chat did was it made it easy for everybody to understand the capabilities that AI can bring. So everybody who even did not know what AI actually was capable of was now able to uh, use ChatGPT and then understand the capabilities or the uh, uses of uh, AI in that, in, that, in that context. It made it very easy for the masses. Having said that, the world is moving so fast in this generative AI space. It was chat GPT, which hit, uh, to your point, 100 million users really fast. But GPT-4 just got released. It, now it's multimodal. It, it claims that it is much better than GPT, uh, chat GPT. So this world is moving really, really fast. So what generative AI is doing is that there are one hand where everybody is trying to one-up each other, where they're like, okay, we are going to infuse all our work tools with, G, uh, with uh, generative AI kind of functions. On the other hand, companies are like, how do we incorporate it, making sure that there are no biases, there are no ethical violations, how do we incorporate it? In either cases, it's only increasing the amount of compute that is needed to actually go perform this AI because predictive AI already had increased the amount of need on the compute. Generative AI is only exploding it by that much. So it's in the end, it's the compute that needs to sustain to actually grow these workloads and that is gonna be the key. Yeah, I love how you brought up that, first of all, it isn't new. And AI has been such a pervasive part of many of our lives, whether it's been recommender engines, whether it's been the chatbots that we engage with, whether it's been business analytics and tools, or even the way we do search today uses elements of machine learning and AI. But with generative, what it is going to do is it's going to drive a crazy amount of additional compute. Some of the early data points that I'm hearing are anywhere from 10 X's to hundreds of thousands of X more compute. This is going to have impacts on everything from cost to sustainability. And of course, price performance is gonna to have to be looked at because as every company is trying to get something out, Kavitha, they also are gonna to have to figure out, well, as I roll out new features, new capabilities, what is it gonna cost us to deliver it? Then what are we gonna to have to charge the customer in order to utilize this service? And then what's the input impact on our carbon footprint? So I'd love it if you touch on those couple of items because I think these are the big things on everyone's mind. No, that's, a, that's a very interesting point you bring up, Daniel, because yes, there is a, increasing demand for compute, but it's expensive to your point, it's not easy. So, and the key also needs to be wherever there is data, there needs to be compute. It's not like you can take all the data to the compute and make it happen. So the compute needs to be where the data is as well. And that's where having this heterogeneous compute is going to be so critical to actually address the needs of this uh, growing demand. Uh, so if you think about it, uh, you know, from an Intel perspective, we have acceleration in our Xeon 4th gen processors. We have, uh, uh, you know, the Flex and Mac series where the 
there is again uh, acceleration built in. And then we also have dedicated accelerators in Habana Gaudi where uh, we, we can have acceleration because what happens is with this growth in demand for compute, price per performance becomes very, very critical. And when you look at this generative AI, most of these are based on LTM kind of, that, that is the building block of all these models. So you're moving away from general purpose compute more and more to a ASSP like of compute. That's where Habana Gaudis play a very, very good role because now what you're doing is you're removing the general purpose nature of it and you're making it dedicated to go address the needs of these uh, workloads. And that's where the price performance comes into picture and that is going to be critical to actually make sure we are meeting the needs of this growing demand at a price performance advantage that can meet the needs. And that's where Intel is focused on. It's going to be a big area of focus. And I can tell you already from the software ecosystem and the demand, enterprises are going to be watching very closely the impacts, both, like I said, on cost, price, performance. And of course, every company right now is being asked, governed to have a, a policy on sustainability. And with compute utilizing such a large percentage of the world's energy, that's going to be important. Now, I'm going to talk more with uh, you, Lama, about that in a little bit when we get to to. to, to to social and ethical AI, I'd like to talk a little bit about that as well. But uh, Kavitha, one more thing, because uh, I want to shift over to Jeff at Hugging Face a little bit, but I want to kind of have you bridge that. You've talked a lot about hardware, and of course the hardware is important, and of course moving from general purpose to ASICs makes a lot of sense in, in a number of different cases. But the software has always been a bit of what's driven sort of that transformation. It's it's what's enabled companies and developers to utilize AI effectively. What do you see that role? Is it going to be new companies breaking through? Is it going to be new hardware paired with software? Is it the compilers? Where is that sort of ecosystem and the open ecosystem going to play a role? You hit it very rightly, Daniel, because all said and done, AI is a software play, uh, software play first. It's a software, a software needs to work right out of the box. Because most of the personas of the developers, they are operating at very high level. They are operating at frameworks, they are coding in PyTorch. They, are not, they wanna get the performance out of the box. They wanna get the performance, but they wanna be hardware agnostic. They wanna be able to code at higher levels, but get the performance. So from that perspective, we need to have the software layer as a homogenizing factor for all the heterogeneity of the compute. And in that context, if you think about the Xeon processes that Intel has, has the largest software ecosystem that actually enables uh, uh, you know, developers to code right out of the box. And the same thing applies for our other heterogeneous elements too. The software stack that we are building for our accelerators makes sure that the performance is, got, is, is derived right out of the box so customers don't have to worry about coding to the hardware but can operate at the frameworks level. Because without that software capability, it's, you can have dime a dozen accelerators or dime a dozen architectures, things won't just scale because ease of use and uh, you know, development to deployment is a critical KPI that is needed to actually go drive adoption of these hardware in the industry. Well, Kavitha, thanks for that. And Jeff, and I wanted to get over to you and talk a little bit about large language models. You know, that has been a huge topic. Of course, the whole chat GPT thing brought it to the, the mainstream, but there's going to be so much more behind it. And of course, as we see it go from open internet to companies being able to leverage masses of proprietary data that exists inside of everything from computer vision systems to their systems of record, the large language models are going to play a huge role. And so at Hugging Face, you're playing a really important role in this space. Um, you know, you're working on open source machine learning libraries, you're creating transformers, uh, sorry, you're creating the transformer uh, large language model. It's one of the most powerful models ever created for deep learning. I'd like you to build a little bit on Kavitha's point about the needs for more compute demands, but also talk a little bit about transformers and diffusers and why they're requiring so much more compute resources. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. And uh, as you say, Kavitha, that uh, we're noticing now with ChatGPT and GPT-4 and all these other models, uh, this uh, trend of generative AI uh, going into mainstream attention, but really from a technology perspective, it's really an evolution that is building upon the last four to five years of research. And to understand like why it is driving so much compute, I think it's important, important to roll back the tape a little bit. And to me, like the, the most impactful 
uh, advance uh, in AI over the past five years is the advent of transfer learning, right? And what transfer learning, what enabled transformers and now diffusers, is the ability to create those gigantic pre-trained models that have already been trained on gigantic corpora of data using massive amounts of compute to get a model that can work off the shelf in various different ways. And that's what created this Cambrian explosion of number of models and variants that can be adapted in any language to any task. And that's why today we have over 150,000 models that are hosted on the Hugging Face Hub that are open source, free, and, and publicly accessible. And so I think that's what's been driving this exponential increase of compute. You have these larger models that require more memory, that require faster processing, that require these new types of uh, operations that are very heavy matrix multiplication um, that power all of these new usages. And so running one model is very, uh, is very challenging from a compute perspective. But now imagine when you have 150,000 of them, and that's what we have on the Hugging Face Hub, right? And we need to be able to serve them. We have millions of people coming every month on the Hugging Face Hub to try those models, to see how they behave, to test them. And to be able to do that, we need to be able to serve any of the 150,000 models, each of them being like super challenging uh, to run uh, for anybody who, who, who is coming. And so that was a huge challenge for us as, a, as, a, as an engineering organization uh, to, uh, to solve. And uh, that's, that's one of the, the great, uh, I think, perks for the community of our collaboration between uh, Intel and Hugging Face. So now, if you go to Hugging Face on any of those 150,000 models, you have a little interface so you can interact with them, give them a prompt, see how it reacts, get it to create an image, etc. And all of that is powered by the uh, Xeon Ice Lake uh, uh, CPU uh, machines. And all of that is uh, sponsored by, by Intel. So it's a really important, uh, I think, fruit of our collaboration that enables the community uh, to understand how it works, uh, test it, and use open source uh, machine learning. And I guess that's what creates the edge to cloud continuum or as well, I'm assuming, Jeff, because they they'll deploy, you know, train it once and deploy it anywhere. That's where you need the edge to cloud continuum and your software needs to scale all the way from the edge to the cloud, I'm assuming. And that's, that's where right. Intel plays a huge role as well. That's right. And it doesn't end at the demo stage, right? Because yeah. our goal as the leading machine learning uh, open source library is to enable the community to build. And that's where uh, what you were saying, Dan Daniel, is that we need to integrate from the hardware all the way to the software so that the abstractions, the, labor, the libraries, the APIs that data scientists and developers uh, can use uh, can take advantage of all the new innovations uh, on the hardware. So that's like one of the main missions of our collaboration uh, between Hugging, Hugging Face and Intel to make sure that our open source offers the full capabilities of uh, Intel hardware. And we do this for uh, Xeon, of course. We have an optimum Intel uh, open source library that we build together and um, is accessible and free to use. That takes advantage of the best uh, of Intel AI open source to take advantage of the, the most advanced features uh, of Intel processors. We have um, optimum Habana. Right so that you can easily use uh, Habana Gaudi uh, to train and uh, serve uh, our models uh, faster. So yeah, it's, it's uh, the, uh, making uh, machine learning uh, easy to use and affordable is something that we can only solve if the hardware and the software are working hand in hand. Uh, and it's, it's a huge challenge. And the importance becomes even more significant as volume grows. I think we talk about 100 million users and it's early days and the number of queries are still relatively small. If we saw the level of participation on these generative AI models at the same level as people are using something like a Google search on a day-to-day -day basis, the amount of compute required is going to be enormous. The impact and the necessity to optimize the relationship between hardware and software is going to become a tremendous opportunity. 
And it goes back to the earlier comments from, uh, you know, that Kavitha and I made about, you know, the impact on cost and sustainability. We really need to get these things right sooner uh, because the scale will happen very quick. We went from zero to 100 million faster than ever. And the next 100 million plus, will, it will be happening in real time right before our eyes. You know, another part of this whole AI, generative AI story that's really coming to bear is going to be about ethics. Everything from how do companies make sure that AI doesn't displace workers to social responsibility to building ethical AI to make sure information is factual, uh, that we're not misinformation and disinformation centric in this world. Talk a little bit broadly about the ethical implications of AI technology. Um, you know, should people be worried? And, you know, how can we create a more accountable world with generative AI moving as fast as it is? Yeah, so um, fantastic question. And I think, you know, I mean, clearly we're all very excited about where AI is headed and where generative AI is headed. But at the same time, I mean, we've really seen a lot of ethical concerns that have been coming up, whether it's around uh, misuse, uh, misinformation, you know, job loss, replacing people, um, a lot of toxicity and bias issues and so on. So really, I think at the end of the day, we have to be thinking every day about how do we develop AI responsibly. And that means, you know, we, we've clearly seen companies coming up, you know, we've, we've done a lot of work in that space. Many companies have done um, work in trying to, first of all, kind of like set where that North Star needs to be, right? What are those principles that we want to go after? What are the ways that we put these principles into action? How do we incorporate these into the development life cycle of these uh, projects? How do we actually bring the competency level of everyone who's actually doing that development to the point where they're asking these questions, right? What, how do we make this less biased? What information do we actually put out to ensure that we're able to understand how these systems are built and how to interrogate them? Um, how do we think through the unintended consequences, right? I mean, we, you know, when you bring a lot of multidisciplinary approaches to the table, when you have people thinking about unintended consequences when things go out into the world, you can start to think through these from the beginning and make sure that throughout the design life cycle, you know, from design to development to deployment, that you're actually trying to mitigate these risks and concerns and all of that. So I think that's absolutely critical and it's a responsibility that falls on all of us. And we need to be all open and discussing that very openly because at the end of the day, it really takes a village to actually bring that to bear, right? The second piece that I just want to mention quickly here is that it's extremely important to be thinking about where research and development plays in to also mitigate some of those risks, right? So when we talk about generative AI, I mean, things are improving at such a fast pace that especially when we start to think about misinformation, it's like it's very hard for people to understand what is real and what is fake. But you can also start to apply technology to start to detect these type of problems, right? So some of the work, for example, around fake catcher and trying to utilize much more of the human authentic signals, right? I mean, people have ways by which they gaze and their heart rate goes and all of these things. So you start to think about multimodality in a very different way to start to say, how can innovation come in to help us understand what's real and what's not? How do we put provenance throughout that system so that we can help people you know, understand where misinformation is happening and kind of mitigate those things very early on. Yeah, there's a, there's so much there, Lama, and, and I could spend probably 30 minutes straight with you just kind of diving into this because these are the questions I get every day when I'm talking to press, when I talk to media as an analyst. They're very interested in what the implications are. And of course, I've seen demonstrations now of things that could easily fool the average person. And we need to put, it's a little bit like cybersecurity, how you need to kind of have that constant cat and mouse. And we're going to have to do the same thing with AI because there's going to be nefarious uses of it, of course, and we're going to have to suss them out. And like I said, some of the most basic nefarious uses is just misinformation, but all the way to the point now where everybody and every person can be deep baked. And if we don't have a system that can quickly identify that. So these are big risks. And of course, as generative gets more and more capable, the risks are going to get higher and the stakes are going to get higher. So I really appreciate you diving into that. The transparency, very important as well. Um, as we sort of wrap this up, 
And I would love to spend more time talking here, but I do want to get everyone back on their days, uh, back to their days. I can tell the passion in all of you and clearly both Intel and Hugging Face are very committed to driving new innovation to, to deliver greater AI accessibility and of course, deliver an open ecosystem. So I'm going to kind of do a last, we'll call it a speed round around the horn. Just talk a little bit more about the work you're doing that's going to really make this technology more accessible. And why do you believe the open ecosystem is so important for the future of generative AI? Uh, Jeff, I'll start with you. We'll go a little out of order this time. Thanks, Daniel. Happy to start. I mean, for us, it's really a, a core belief. I mean, it's you know our mission as a company. Most people who are working at Hugging Face join Hugging Face because of that, because we, our mission is to democratize good machine learning. And to do that, uh, we want to do everything in an open way, open source. Um, and open source, there's lots that goes into that, right? There's like open source code implementation. There's the availability of the data sets. There's the, the availability of the weights. There's transparency around the research. So open source. We do that through community-driven uh, development, and we do that through ethics-first machine learning, meaning we start the considerations around everything that you talked about, Lama, before uh, at the beginning of projects, not as, a, as an afterthought. So that's really, really important to us, and I feel like it's really, really important for the field right now. Like, as uh, I mean, the, the last few weeks have been amazing, but like this gap, this growing gap between academia and what's available to researchers and what is available as a capability, as an API in closed systems has been widening. And that's a huge issue for the field. That's a huge issue for society, for regulators, you name it. Um, the latest release, we mentioned GPT-4, um, you don't know what data was trained on. You don't know how it was trained. Uh, you don't even know how big the model is or how much it costs to run it, right? And that's, that's, that's an issue. As a researcher, you can't really poke into it, understand, try to improve it. So that's, that's, um, that's, uh, that's a huge, uh, huge problem. Our approach is really to uh, enable the community uh, to progress the, the field uh, together, uh, progress, uh, yeah, collaboratively, um, and and then there is another point because you mentioned accessibility and in accessibility, there is also affor affordability. And that's what we were talking about earlier, uh, Kavitha. And I think that's really important because we want as many people as possible to be able to take advantage of, uh, of the capabilities. And um, yeah, I'm super proud of the work that uh, we're uh, doing uh, together uh, on that. Uh, there's, um, there's like three good examples, I think. Uh, around this like one is um, so the latest generation of uh, Intel Xeon Sapphire Rapids I don't know if everybody knows it under this name but like the latest generation the fourth generation uh, enables some really advanced uh, matrix multiplication right and so we're able to take advantage of that and like the advanced data type that have been created for machine learning uh, in order to accelerate things um, and we've measured uh, the improvements um, between the, the latest generation and the previous one. Um, and it's incredible. And so now you can actually train uh, large language models on CPU. And most people don't know that. You use distributed training and you spread it across uh, multiple uh, devices and you're able to go much, much faster. We measure like 8x faster than the previous generation. So that's amazing. Another thing is on inference. Uh, so inference is when you're actually using the models and doing all these predictions. So on inference, uh, we're able to measure like four to five X improvement. So we're talking about generative AI, like one part of it is generating images. So we know, all know about stable diffusion, which is an open source way of creating those images. Um, and so we're able to see like images being generated from a simple text, like within five seconds, like end to end, like I type some text, I get an image in five seconds. That's amazing. And you can try today on Hugging Face. Uh, we have like a great demo application, a space uh, for that. So that's one example. Another example is with those uh, purposefully built uh, accelerators, hardware accelerators. 
Habana Gaudi, right? That's built from the ground up, designed for uh, AI. And so here we are working uh, closely with the engineering team. And so we're being, um, we are able to really measure and put into the hands of people uh, the acceleration capabilities. And we ran some tests on uh, Gaudi 2 and the speed ups are amazing. So you have that much more memory. So if for people who know, like it's 96 megabit per device. So that's actually huge. You can fit big models. We're talking about generative AI. These are big models. So you can fit them and then use that to train faster or use that to run inference um, uh, faster. And the cost savings are huge. So that's super important for the community. So they know that they can have the confidence that they can train those models themselves using CPU and even the largest models, they can pre-train them, they can run them using those accelerators and keep their costs under control. And then another uh, example I want to give you is more on the research side. And we had this great collaboration uh, with uh, the Intel AI research team around a new way of doing um, few shot learning for sentence transformers. So we were talking about search earlier, Daniel. So that's really to power semantic search and this kind of use cases. And this method is called SetFit. And we created a new open source package uh, together. It's hosted on Hugging Face. So it's at GitHub, Hugging Face, SetFit. And uh, it's incredibly popular. Uh, it's got over 1,200 GitHub stars already. And what it allows you to do is to really efficiently train these types of large language models for semantic search. Instead of having a huge model, you can have a much, much smaller model that's going to be much more cost effective to run and scale. So super excited about uh, those uh, collaborations. I think it's important for the community, right? The, I mean, Intel devices are the most uh, widely available uh, in the market. So we want to make sure that the benefits of machine learning and generative AI are accessible to as many people as possible. Super important work. Well, Jeff, there was a, a lot to unpack there and you touched on a few different things, whether it's been democratizing and making uh, AI more accessible, which was a big part of my question. And of course, you even mentioned something that uh, we didn't have much time to get to, but you know, the whole regulatory and governance, which probably deserves a whole nother conversation. And maybe you'll touch on that in your uh, final remarks here, Lama. So I'm going to go, go to you and just kind of ask you, uh, following up on some of Jeff's comments about accessibility, sort of, you know, what what's some of the work that you're doing to focus on making the tech more accessible? Yeah, so I mean, I would say, maybe if we step back a second about the whole open ecosystem piece. And I think that's really, really key, um, not just in terms of how do we enable innovation to continue to happen at a very rapid pace, but also in having that openness and that transparency, it's really key to the ethical concerns that we were talking about earlier. So, you know, one of the things that, you know, would enable us, if we think about the AI supply chain more broadly, right? The way we all operate at the speed of light right now that's happening is that we're all building on top of each other's work, right? That's the only way that we can actually advance things at that scale. But that creates a certain level of debt from an ethical perspective, right? Because we really need to understand before we build on things, you know, how these things were built, how they were trained, what data set were used, what, you know, ethical concerns are there. How do we need to think about sustainability, right? And not burning up the planet in the way that we're doing that. So having that transparency in the AI supply chain is so key. And having an open system, an, an open ecosystem is really only the way, the only way that we can get there. And I think where you were kind of hitting on earlier is that we are starting to see that issue, right? That conflict, that uh, contention, because people are concerned about their IP and they want to keep things that are closed, right? So we're starting to see less and less yeah, direction in terms of really talking about how these things were built because people are worried about all of their investment going out of the window. But Given all of the ramifications and the ethical implications, right? I can't see how a closed open, a closed system would actually get us to getting to the potential of AI, to the true potential of AI, and not essentially hit a wall with all of these um, concerns and ethical implications. So I can't overemphasize how important that is. We've been, you know, in everything in terms of the development work that we've been doing, we've really brought in 
from the get-go transparency in the whole development cycle, right? From the point that we even think about a project to every single capability that we put out in the world, you know, having all the information about what it was trained on, you know, all the model card information, everything that goes around that, being out and open is absolutely key. And I really hope that all of us actually do that because I think this is how we actually get to that bright future of AI. Lam, I really appreciate the leadership role that you and Intel are taking on this particular topic. I believe transparency is going to play such a critical role in bringing more and more of the technology ecosystem and the companies that are building, developing, and utilizing uh, AI, generative AI technologies, having that level of transparency is going to be very important. Kavitha, I'd like to have you help wrap this up with me. Um, talk a little bit about the open ecosystem in particular and why this is so important for the future of generative AI. Definitely, Daniel. And I think Jeff and Lemma uh, summarized it very well. Like Jeff mentioned, Hugging Face is looking at democratizing ML. Intel is looking at democratizing compute. And to your early point, develop once, deploy everywhere. That is crucial for us to democratize AI. That is where you can build it on these large clusters, but you can deploy it on the edge, on the enterprise. It could be enterprise edge or telco edge. It could be in the cloud. It could be in the data center. And for that to happen, you need a software ecosystem that is open, that is scalable, that is something that some, in anybody and everybody can trust. And that's what Intel's focus is. All the optimizations, we have the heterogeneity of the hardware to your earlier point. We have acceleration where the compute is. We have it in Xeons, we have it in uh, uh, GPUs that we are bringing to the market. We have it in Habana Gaudi accelerators. So along with that, we are homogenizing it with what we call one API, but all the optimizations that we are doing for this hardware, we give it into the open ecosystem. We up-level it into the TensorFlow. We up-level it into the PyTorch so customers can gain the benefits right out of the box. Hugging Face works very closely with us to take those benefits that we uh, up-level it to go build on top of it. That is the only way to actually democratize compute and democratize AML and democratize generative AI. And that's where the world is headed and I'm very proud of the work that Intel and Hugging Face are doing to democratize this and make sure that the open ecosystem plays a solid role uh, in making this happen, complete with trust and addressing responsibility and ethics in the, in, a, in the process, that is what is critical. Kavitha, Lama, Jeff, I wanna thank you so much for being a great panel, for having this conversation with me. Something I'm very passionate about and I can tell that all of you are very passionate about it too. Of course, everyone out there that joined us for this conversation, I want to thank you too. If you'd like to check out more on the work that Intel and Hugging Face are doing to address the compute needs for generative AI, please head to Intel's newsroom and you'll be able to find more information there. We look forward to keeping this conversation going. And of course, we look forward to talking more with all of you very soon. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.